I'd like you to read with me this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and we're going to read <coughs> from verse... verse 18. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse number 18, please. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of this world? Hath not God made foolish the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God, the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of the preaching to save them that believe. Now that's all we're going to read, and we know that God will bless the reading of his precious word. Now, there's a place that is near and dear to my heart, and it's not the country where I was born, although I like it okay, and I love the land that I live in today, but that place is the local assembly. And the First Corinthians and Second Corinthians, to some degree, uh, are the charter of the church. I know J.R. Caldwell wrote two little books on First Corinthians, and that was the title, The Charter of the Church. And in chapter 1, uh, uh, First Corinthians... In chapter 1, uh, we read of the assembly uh, as the church of God. And we know that when we read the scriptures, read our Bibles, that always refers to the local assembly. Uh, and that's the purpose for which we are here. The purpose is to represent God in this world. I don't know if we're doing a very good job, but at least that's what God uh, desires for us. Uh, we read more about the local assembly when we come into chapter 3. Uh, we read that it as God's tilled field, God's uh, garden. We reminded it last night. And that is as to its planting. An assembly has to be planted. Uh, Paul, uh, he planted and uh, others watered. He said, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. And he said, we are workers together with God. He wasn't putting himself on a level with God, but he was saying we're workers together and we're doing God's work. And then he speaks of it as a building in chapter 3. And it's a building, not so much the planting and the growth that's in view, uh, but uh, the plan is what is very important in chapter 3. The assembly must go according to the divine plan. It's not left for you or for I to decide uh, what it should be, uh, but we have the, uh, the plan uh, in the Word of God and especially in the writings of the Apostle Paul. Then he said it's a it's temple of God in chapter 3. And that's associated with the presence of God. It's a place where the Holy Spirit uh, is. And we go through the book. We come to chapter uh, 12, is it? Uh, and we find the provision that God has made in the assembly. He said the assembly is like a body. Uh, and each member is absolutely necessary. You may not think that, uh, but it's true. And we should never try to push someone... Uh, out of God's uh, assembly. God has provided gifts in the, the assembly. And then when we come into Second Corinthians, we read that ye are an epistle known and read of all men. Uh, and uh, uh, that's speaking not so much of individuals, although that may be true, but it's speaking of the local assembly. He, he said, Paul said, we don't need any commendation. You are our commendation, known and read of all men. Uh, men. So that's the privilege that we have. We have a privilege as being part of an assembly uh, to represent God in this uh, old world in which we live. And then, of course, you know as well that Paul said, I will present you as a chaste virgin unto Christ. So that's the purity of the assembly. So when you read through 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, it's really a, a wilderness book, uh, and it shows us how we should live and how we should behave as part of God's uh, assembly. Now, there's one thing uh, that there is in every assembly. You wonder what that is, and I'm, t I'm w looking at the wide aspect, even some that we wouldn't be in full fellowship with, 
But there's something in every assembly, and that's what I'm going to talk about. And what is it? Well, we read about it, and it's wisdom. There's wisdom in every assembly. Well, you say, is that true? Well, it is, but sometimes it's God's wisdom. That's what we want. Other times it's men's wisdom, and sometimes maybe there can be a, a mixture as well. But, but you, you and I uh, we're, should be taken up with God's wisdom. It's something that the world doesn't understand. And yet many believers in Corinth were going according to man's wisdom. So I just want to go through the, the book and pick out a few things uh, and use your, uh, your memory. Uh, and I'm sure you, you've all read uh, your Bible. I know a little bit about 1 Corinthians. The first thing is, in chapter 1, there were contentions in the assembly. And those contentions were caused by people using men's wisdom. And what did men's wisdom say? It's still working today uh, in, in religious circles. Men's wisdom says, you get the man that can really preach, and you put him in the pulpit. Uh, and uh, if he's in the pulpit, uh, we'll get more people to come in. We'll get somebody that's really gifted. Uh, and uh, that's the wisdom of men. So that some said, I am of Paul, and I am of uh, Cephas, of Paul, Apollos. And some said, I am of Christ. And uh, that's a, an illustration uh, that's really showing what kind of preachers sometimes people like. I don't know if that's me making all this snapping noise or whatever it is. But anyhow... Some say, I, I, I want to be like Cephas. He's the apostle to the circumcision. And I, I like those that are a bit on the legal side. And they really lay down the law. And you've got to do this and so on. Uh, well, uh, we don't really need that. There's others that said, I'd rather have Paul. He te te teaches us about our Christian liberty. So we can do uh, whatever we uh, like. And some say, I'd rather have Apollos. Apollos was an eloquent man. And every preacher, I'm sure, would all like to be more eloquent than we are. Uh, but that's not the answer. And some said, I'm of Christ. I'm not really sure if they were right or not. They could have said, I'm not going to listen to any man. I'm just going to listen to uh, uh, what, what uh, the, the Lord says. I, I know a man that said, you shouldn't read any books, just your Bible. And you wouldn't believe it. He wrote a book. I don't know what he expected uh, if, he, if people were going to just to ignore it or what uh, but uh, we need to be occupied with Christ that's the important thing we need God's wisdom said you give this man a uh, place Paul said was I uh, I wasn't crucified for you and, and I didn't baptize any except a few uh, uh, God sent me to preach the gospel and he was occupied with Christ and that's God's wisdom said, you give the Lord Jesus Christ that preeminent place. That's the, that's the important thing. That's what the assembly is all about. And I'm in a local assembly in a place called Stout in Iowa right now. And do you know why I'm there? Because the Lord is there. That's the important thing. And if that doesn't hold me, nothing else will hold me. So that's uh, man's wisdom. It says one man ministry. God's wisdom says use the gifts. Now that doesn't mean that we abuse these things. Really, we don't believe in one man ministry and we don't believe in all man ministry. But there are gifts that are given that should be used. And then in chapter 2, uh, Paul speaks about his preaching and he says it's not with enticing words of men's wisdom. That's what, that's what man uh, says. Uh, you, you give them words that they, that they, they like. Uh, and and uh, some of the books that are published today and they tell you how to get all kinds of people in and how you cater to this one and how you cater to that one. And some of us, like myself, we're old fogies that are way behind the time and we need to come up to, uh, uh, to date. But Paul says we preach Christ crucified. That's the important thing. Uh, that's really uh, what he uh, did uh, when he, he, he said, Other foundation can no man lay in chapter 3. And that which is laid, which is Christ. There's no other foundation. How did he lay the foundation? He laid the foundation by cre preaching Christ. We preach Christ and Christ crucified. He wasn't preaching a Christ still on a cross. But it's the abiding effects of the work of Calvary. And that's what we preach when we preach the gospel. You say, what about heaven and hell? Certainly. That's a background to the gospel. But the gospel message itself is a message concerning 
the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the gospel of God, a message that originated in the heart of God uh, and a, a message that is concerning His Son, Jesus Christ, the Lord Jesus Christ. And then when we come to chapter uh, 3, the problem there is carnality. Uh, and uh, that is seen uh, in a way that sometimes we maybe wouldn't just look at it. Uh, and uh, uh, when I preach from First Corinthians 3, one of the little captions I have is worldliness in the assembly. Now, I'm not talking about uh, going to the dance hall and the movies and all. Those things are worldly, but it's really how we think. That's the important thing uh, that we have in chapter 3. Carnality. What does that say? Carnality says you'll get the big thing. Wood, hay, stubble. And, 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 and a, a lot of places go in for the, uh, the big thing. They, they want to have a real big uh, show. 